Michael. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Pleasure to uh, connect, Michael. <laughs> thank you for doing this. Absolutely, my pleasure. That's great. So I guess we'll just we'll just start with um, how does a an actor from come from New York and end up in uh, Hollywood and become probably the most successful theater casting director in Hollywood? Because when I think of theater. I think of, well, coming from Ireland, I think of West End and then I think of New York. They're the two places and you've had such a, such a successful career. I was checking out your credits. You've, you've had some uh, amazing, well-known actors in some brilliant Shakespeare plays. And, and, and I guess just coming from how did, um, how did an actor end up in that would give a good. And uh, I, I directed a play in Hollywood, actually, that uh, another casting director came to see and, uh, she came backstage and she told me she was very impressed with the uh, direction and would I be interested in directing casting sessions? I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> Not a clue. But I'm like, somebody's offering me money. I'm an actor. So sure, of course. And two days later, she hired me and I'm like, okay, I better figure this out. And uh, so um, it was uh, starting with commercials and um, they used to, in a commercial audition, you would have two people in the room, the person running camera, and then the person who was called the session director and he or she would guide you through the process of the audition. It's now been blended down to one person who does both. But at the time it was two. And um, so that's where it started. Um, I uh, found that I really enjoyed it a great deal. It was a really good experience for me to get to work with actors. And also I was, it was a kind of a survival job because it wasn't every day. Um, and um, eventually uh, there was another person, uh, Megan Foley, who offered me a full-time gig, and, but she said it was cool if I went on auditions. And so I thought, oh, this might work. And then I found myself on auditions, started to think about what was happening in the casting office. And I went, oh, this is, I'm transitioning. You know? And I think the other thing that happened too was I got to the point where it was less fun for me. I mean, um, I, for me personally, I always played so much younger than I was, like absurdly younger than I was. When I was 27, I booked a 14 year old. And at 33, I was still going out for like, you know, college. And it was frustrating to, it was, oh, you look so young, young, that's great. I'm like, yeah. You know, by the time you're 33, you figure you're not competing with the college kids anymore. And I was still competing with the college kids. So uh, that began to be frustrating. And so I started to transition out of it. And um, again, as I said, started with commercials. Um, did about 1,200 commercials, something crazy like that, and eventually went out on my own. And then, um, um, well, I partnered with Megan first in a theatrical company. We started doing some film and television casting, and uh, and then somebody offered us a play, and I was like, "Wow, well, that's my whole background." And this career just came at me. It was amazing. I just, it was so exciting to see. Um, how much theater was happening in Los Angeles, and I wasn't even aware myself. Of LA is not thought of as a theater town at all, as you know, you just said. Um, you know, it's all New York and it's all West End, but it, it's simply not true. There's a tremendous theater community in LA, a very vibrant theater community in LA. And um, it just, this whole career just opened up and it's been, I'm very grateful and uh, it's been amazing and, um, and I love it. I, I get to do something that I love to do, which I think a lot of people don't. And so I'm incredibly grateful for that. Do you think it's because um, a lot of actors, there's a lot of actors in, in LA, do you think a lot of them are, are sick of waiting for the phone to, to ring and, and in the meantime, they're going to get involved in a performance or get involved in a play and keep their skills up? Is that, is that most of it? There's a thing called, there used to be a thing called equity waiver in town. I think at one time people did uh, theater to get film and television work. Um, I think there's still a certain faction of that, yes, but I think mostly I think you do theater because you love it. Uh, and I think because you want to keep uh, improving your craft and, and stretching yourself as an artist and all of those things. And, and I think at one time you were, you were either a film actor, you were a television actor, you were a theater actor, you were a commercial actor. That's, that's all bullshit. You're an actor. I want an actor. Um, and so I think that, you know, theater to me is the best training there is. There's no cut, go back to one, you know, if the, door doesn't open or the window doesn't open or somebody screws up a line or whatever you 
deal with it. And, and there's nothing more exciting to me than that. The immediacy of, of theater is, is what I find so exciting. The, the emotional connection and uh, the ability to stay in character for two and a half hours and tell a story with an arc uh, uh, is, is just incredibly exciting. So I, I, I don't think it's just about being in between television and film gigs. I, I do think it's something that people just love to do. And a great deal of theater is, uh, is respected here. And, and there's also things that are developed in Los Angeles that go on to Broadway I, I, and to the West End. Um, if you want to talk about my current uh, show, uh, Sleepless. Um, Sleepless, the musical, uh, is opening in the West End on uh, the very end of August. It's going to be the first live show to come back. Uh, so we're going to see if this is going to happen. Um, but it started at Pasadena Playhouse uh, in LA and um, um, they took it out of the market, retooled it greatly and decided to open it on, on the West End. So um, yeah, I'm one of the cast directors on that. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working, you know, uh, not just LA. I, I have, uh, you know, I do a lot of projects throughout the country and um, yeah. in New York regularly as well. And uh, this is my first uh, West End thing, uh, so that's exciting, and and I won't be able to see it. That's because good. Americans can't go to England, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think? Do you think that? Um, do you think that actors can have a good, long, full career in the theater? Because um, I did have uh, Phil Carlson. He was the agent for uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and we just discussed it a little bit. We discussed how coming from that. Irish background I have uh, f an obsession with Irish plays with Samuel Black uh, Beckett <clears throat> and, and them kind of works and doing theater and I did say to him that you know we were talking about uh, approaching an agent and that's um, my love for wanting to do theater and he said for him because he came from that old school era that that's the kind of actor he wanted but nowadays they don't really want to hear that because there's no commercial there's no money in it for the agent and it, it's not too easy to get to pick up an, a good agent and they know that you want to do 50% theater and that means you're out for productions that are weeks, months on end and you're not there to bring in the revenue for the film or bring it in for the TV. It depends on um, the agency. There are in LA, there's about half a dozen, half a dozen agencies that have specific theater departments. So you can be with somebody for theater only, you can be with somebody for film, television and theater. Um, so I think that um, if you know you're signing somebody for theater, you know that that's not going to probably be your big money maker. No, um, but usually, I think at least in LA, a lot of actors try to do a mix. So they uh, do something for their craft and for their you know their heart, <laughs> and then they do something for their wallet. Uh, not to say that film and television can't be also for your heart, but um, I, I think if you try to do a combination of both, that's how you survive uh, as an actor in Los Angeles. In New York, it's it's different. You know, you can have a very lucrative career, I think, in theater in New York and do just theater if you're if you're lucky enough to go from show to show. The thing about it is, of course, as we know, a lot of times actors are out of work, so it's that whole time that in between time that gets a little scary. Uh, but yeah, I think right now, I think the ideal thing to do for an actor is do a little bit of everything, to be as versatile as possible, so that you can go from medium to medium and. And your strengths that you learn from each of those mediums will help everything else that you do and just make you a better actor. Uh, I love the actors that, you know, have a, a TV series and then do something, you know, like you said, like Shakespeare or something during the summer. It's like, that's awesome. You know, it's like, wait a minute, this person who has a, you know, sort of silly sitcom can do Shakespeare. That's, a, well, of course, you know, a silly sitcom is a play. That's what a sitcom is. It's a play that there's cameras, you know, so. Uh, uh, I think uh, I, I think being as versatile as possible is what you want to be as an actor right now. Yeah, I was talking to Jim Sheridan, the Irish director, on the phone the other day, and he we we're just talking about you know trying to get work, trying to get something, and he said to me, "Why aren't you putting on a play?" He said, "That's what we did coming up when we had nothing to do. We put a play on." I think we're kind of falling out of that a little bit on this side of the world maybe because there's not that much theater and it's such an easy thing to do is practice a play and put it out especially right now i mean i, I mean this is a very strange time for all of this but do do play readings on zoom i mean you're all if necessary you pick up you each have a script at home you it's i mean you just can do it so easily just 
I don't understand why people, you know, wouldn't do that. Keep your chops up, keep your craft up, keep your skill up, do everything you can. Uh, uh, we did the first, I think the first play that was written for Zoom, Murray Mednick's uh, play, Blackouts. Uh, uh, he, Murray had been in the hospital about, I don't know, about eight, nine months ago or something, and he had started to write this play from the perspective of a patient in the hospital. And then when COVID-19 hit, he changed it to the perspective of a patient in the hospital during COVID-19, which of course is a completely different thing. And, um, and we did it live. Uh, it, technical challenges for days, for days, but it, we still did it. And so it, it proves that it can be done. And I think, you know, we need people to be creative geniuses right, right now, figure this out, figure out a way that we can be entertained and still be creative in this, uh, you know, crazy world that we're all living in right now. And I think it is possible to do it. And I, I kind of, the actor that kind of sits and waits for it to come to him, I kind of go, really? Why aren't you creating something yourself? You know, don't you know somebody who likes to write? Don't you know somebody who likes to direct? Um, put something together, you know? Find a way to be, uh, to master this medium. Uh, find a way to do something that, you know, we can't take our eyes off of. Uh, I don't know if you saw the You Can't Stop the Beat video from the Hairspray actors and lots of other actors that sang You Can't Stop the Beat. That was mine. I, I cast that and um, it was one of the producers on it. And I mean, we had a ball doing it together and, and there's like 140 actors in it and actors from all over the place, all, all over the country, different other countries. And, and it was a, a logistical, you know, huge project to master, but we did it. And, and you can do that. You can create something that's really fun and entertaining and just lifts your spirits. So. Mm. When you're, exactly. When you're casting uh, a theater over a movie or TV, is there, a, is there something you're looking for in that actor versus TV? Because when we're told a lot by casting directors that really know your package, know your type and know what you're right for. But if you're going for a play, are you really a type or, you know, is it discriminating to say you're not really a Hamlet or you're not really a Blanche Dubois? Is that, or is it that really you're going for the talent who's the best in that room, but they mightn't even be the right um, race or color? Does that make sense? It, well, it's interesting that you're bringing this up because this is the, the uh, hot topic of uh, discussion everywhere right now. Um, I fully support the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, I think it's high time that people have... Uh, of different ethnicities, uh, uh, you know, gender, everything. I mean, we need to be more inclusive. We need to be more diverse. So I think we're opening that up a bit. And I think maybe theater is one of the ones to really embrace that. Um, it's a struggle because sometimes it's like, uh, the example I often give is uh, I did uh, Fences uh, a few years ago. And um, the uh, union, uh, started to insist that in the breakdown that I put all ethnicities. And I said, no, I, I'm, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is an African-American play about an African-American culture with written by an African-American playwright. It's like, it has to be African-American actors. And finally they, they backed down and let me put African-American, but uh, it does bring up a lot of points is that, well, if it's a historical figure, should it be historically the ethnicity that that person was? Should it be, you know, if this were a heavy set lady, do we have to cast it with, the, you know, um, a heavy set actor? I mean, uh, so we're kind of at a really interesting point right now in casting. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real interesting period of transition in which uh, actors of color are saying, why can't we be seen for for atypical roles. Why does it have to be just the traditional casting? And um, I hear that. So I think it depends on the project. Uh, I, I really do. I mean, Hamilton, of course, has you know, blown that all wide open. Um, but there are many other examples of over the years of things that were sort of atypical casting. So, um, so I would say right now, I think it's not as much of a box as it used to be. Uh, I think that, uh, <coughs> even to define things the way that we, we once did, you know, uh, saying somebody's beautiful. Well, what's beautiful? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what's handsome? 
what's, uh, you know, those terms that I think that we once accepted are not so easy right now. So what I would suggest to you is this, if you as an actor feel that you are possibly right for something and it's not ludicrous, why not? Take a shot. Let the envelope be pushed a bit. Uh, but there are times when I go, uh, using fences as, as the example, at the open call, a white actor showed up. I'm like, really? I mean, come on. You know? I mean, what are you doing here? You know? So, um, and do your homework. That's the thing. He didn't do his homework. He didn't know the show. Okay. You can't know every play. You can't know every movie. I understand that. But it's like, you should have done your homework before you came here. Because then you wouldn't have wasted your time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting our time. And there are also times when I think an actor does, like if we're doing an open call, if I may use that as an example, an actor uses an excuse just to get to see me when they know there's absolutely nothing that they're right for in the show. And I think that's a mistake too. I think mm -hmm. that because all you're doing is you're taking the time away from somebody else who could be seen who is right for the show. You know? So you know, wait till you're right for something or, um, or, or submit for a project that you know, you're more right for. And, Maybe not quite the limitations that is, we once had, but be smart. You know, think about yourself as a as a an entity as opposed to the person. Um, does the uh, what you have to offer as an actor fit this big jigsaw puzzle that we're putting together? You know, you may be fantastic, but you're not the right piece to fit into this puzzle, and you know you're not. You know, but you're like, no, no, I can do anything. Well, you know, not, you're not right for everything. It does not. So that's the way it is. Yeah, because the reason I asked was, <coughs> excuse me, the reason I asked was um, you're going to have a lot of social pressure on, on you, but you also have a bit of a pressure to honor the writer and honor the writing. And I've seen a Shakespeare play at the Shakespeare Oval in the UK um, and they swapped the roles. So the girls were dressed as the boys to play the boy roles and the boys were dressed as the girls to play the gr female roles. And I get it, we're going through uh, that kind of a time. But for me, I was completely out of the play for the whole play because I could see the guys dressed as the girls and the girls dressed as the guys. And I was I was trying to see, are they, are they doing a good job in being a male and are the guys doing a good job in being a female? So it kind of didn't work for me. Whereas I thought if they just stuck, let the girls play the female roles and the, the guys play the male roles, it would have been, they were great actors. It would have been a fantastic production. Sometimes it feels gimmicky to me. Sometimes yeah. it feels just like you're doing it just to do it. And going back to your question about do we want just the best actor for the role? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, when producers come to me and say, you know, a certain percentage of the cast has to be of color, it's like, well, what about if it's 100% of the cast that needs to be of color? Why don't we just get the best actors for the role? And, you know, and, and I do understand it's the push for the diversity, the push for the inclusion. I get that. And that I took totally support. So it's a, it's a fine line right now to figure out. And we're all uh, dancing around that and trying to figure out. But we are pushing. Um, I, as I mentioned, started in commercials. And commercials used to be, I mean, white with blonde hair. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that's kind of what commercials used to be. And I used to always push for something else why can't we consider something else and now it's great now it's you know pretty much everything uh including interracial families which is also great which we mm -hmm. never saw at one point that would be a, oh we can't do that because <laughs> that doesn't really happen really you know so as we're finally starting to reflect what's really happening in the world and i think that that's great while we're on auditions um what's the I guess what's the the, the no nos for Michael Donovan? What's the you know what 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 could we as actors? It could only be the the smallest of thing you see that actors commonly mistakes they make, but it's costing them the job. Just a little tweak. It could be even be late. You were rude in the waiting room. You were distracting. Okay, all of that. <laughs> so let's go through a bunch of them. Um, you know, being late to me is uh, is sort of unforgivable. We offer you, the way our company works is we offer you about three different phone numbers uh, and uh, an email and the text in which you can reach us if you're running late. Look, we understand, you know, you were at ABC and you got stuck for some major television role that you really want. They're running an hour behind. Okay, so let us know. So if we know you're running late and we say that's cool, then there's no problem. But 
if you walk in an hour late, it's like now you've pissed everybody off. So now you're walking in with a negative against you. You're walking one, you got one strike already against you. Um, walking in without a picture and resume. Yes, okay. There are times when you don't need a picture and resume. That's absolutely true. For commercials, you almost never need them anymore. How does it hurt for you to have them? Particularly in theater, they almost always want them. They want to hold on to them, you know? And it's not like the old days in which agents used to actually send me pictures and resumes and I get stacks and stacks and stacks of pictures and resumes. Everything comes in online right now. So walk in with pictures and resumes. Don't walk in with just one either. Have them. If you don't need them, great. How does it hurt to have them? But the biggest thing that actors do is walking in unprepared. That's the biggest mistake you can make. Um, and to me, that is just the ultimate no-no. You're wasting your time. You're wasting our time. Why are you walking in unprepared? If you got stuck in a set and didn't get home to four in the morning, you know, call and say, even a little white lie, I'm sick, you know, whatever. Have your agent call and see if we can reschedule you. Any of those reasons. But to walk in and say, oh, I didn't get a chance to read it. I didn't get a chance to look at it. It's like, well, then go home. What, what are we here for? You know, we forget that it's a job interview. And I always say this, it's like, because I was an actor, because I did it for so long, I will be your best friend, I will protect you, I am totally on your side. But if you mess with me, because I was an actor, I'm gonna be your worst enemy. Because it's like, I know, I know how tough it is to get an audition. I know how few chances you get, especially when you're starting out. It's like, and you didn't even take the time to work on this? It's like, I get to work with really talented directors. I work with some amazing directors. I'm so blessed about that. So it's like, now I'm mortified that you, I brought you in to audition for this person who I have great respect for and would not waste his or her time. And now this is what you brought to it? Come on, that's just unforgivable. So, and then, Within that preparation, what I think that actors uh, often do is they're very worried about what do they want, okay? What they want is to see what you want to do with this material that you've been given. That's what they want. Show us why it has to be you. And I think that a lot of actors are afraid of that. Uh, so what happens is a lot of actors do, um, they sort of blend it out. They sort of do this sort of in-between thing so that it's not really offensive and it's not really specific and blah, blah, blah. So it's sort of kind of like pleasant. <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> we don't like pleasant. So don't do pleasant. Uh, make specific choices. The people who are booking are the people who are making specific choices. I don't have to like your choice. But I could totally disagree with your choice. That's okay. Don't make it. See, okay. When I say this, actors think, oh, I need to make an outrageous choice so I'll be noticed. That's not what I said. A specific choice is very different than an outrageous choice. Your specific choice might be perceived to be outrageous. That's possible. But if it's truthful for you, then maybe it's the right choice. You know, the way Jim Carrey does something is very different than the way, uh, maybe somebody low key. I'm trying to think of somebody <laughs> super low key. You know what I mean? Like, Johnny Depp. Or okay, great. So if they're reading for the same role, I don't think it's going to be the same interpretation, you know? So that's what we want. You know, bring me that uniqueness. Bring me how you see the role within reason, obviously. And just going back to the lateness, Michael, does, does Michael Donovan, does he remember, does he have a good memory of those people who were late? And also if an actor comes in and they are, let's just say a couple of no-nos, they're late or whatever. Um, they've already pissed you off, but you've got, but they're, they're outstanding in their audition, but you have an actor who is fully there, fully ready, fully prepared and mm, is okay. Are you leaning more towards the person who is, you know, pissed you off, but is perfect for the role or the guy that was just put in his, put the effort in and was there, was polite. Can that, it's always a struggle. Oh man, it, you know I teach too. I teach, uh, and when I'm teaching UCLA, like there'll be some, you know, kid who is just uh, working his ass off, you know, and does everything right, and it just is okay. And then the other person who barely looks at it and nails it. It's like, damn it, <laughs> that's not fair, you know. Um, I, I will say this. 
doing some of the no-nos raises little red flags for us. Uh, so it makes us more aware of you and we are then really paying close attention at a callback. So if we decided to ignore or accept that there were some bad things that happened at the first audition, but we're still gonna call you back. Now at the callback, now we're looking. Are you late again? Are you unprepared again? Are you, you know, all those things, then it's like, forget it. I don't care how talented you are, I'm not gonna work with you, you know? But, um, but to cast somebody just because they did all the work and because they were diligent and just because they showed up on time, and just because, it, eh, that's not gonna work either. It's gotta be something that, it's a combination of all of those things. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a unscientific process. You know, why do you cast somebody? What happens that, um, that you feel that this person just is the right person? Uh, and oftentimes not at all what you set out to do. Uh, just cast and director or somebody has a, you know, just kind of a different thought and brings in something that, I love to do that by the way. I love to bring, you know, if, if I'm working with you and you're the director and I'll bring you something that you didn't ask for and you're like, I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> let's just try this you know and you're like oh oh I hadn't thought of that and I'm like yeah I know you hadn't thought of that so uh, what I try to do is go like you know on the nosy but then also go all around it too in terms of what other possibilities there might be so and I don't know it's it's so to honor somebody with a role because they were uh, you know a goody two shoes about doing everything right is not going to be, it's not going to be how it's going to work. It's going to, that's a part of it. So what I, I suggest to you as, as an actor is that you eliminate any of the things that might knock you out. All the things, you know, being laid, uh, being, you know, you. Well, I'll tell you one thing that you definitely go home. You're rude to my assistant or my associate. You're out of there. Go away. You're rude. Right. Go home. Yeah. I'm not even going to see you. It's, it's, I'm not going to do it. Period. Um, be nice to everybody, you know, look, and, and the thing about it is <laughs> you should just be nice to everybody, of course, but today's, you know, intern is tomorrow's assistant, is tomorrow's associate, is tomorrow's casting director, and here I am. That's exactly how it happens. And those people, I do remember. People yeah. that root me, hell yeah, I remember. I know there's a lot more actors where you are compared to Sydney. Um, are you, a, are you the kind of person that wants to see new faces or do you continuously bring in the same people that you've seen before? I've been told here in Sydney that um, if people don't know you, it's very hard to get in the room and I would have thought new talent would have always been better to see and put forward to, to directors and say, this is, look at this guy I found. Like, I don't understand casting people that don't see new, new people. I mean, yeah, you want a percentage of your session that you're putting together to be what I call the tried and true, the ones that either you booked before or are working, you know, of course you have to have some of those. You want the solid, solid choices. Uh, then to me, like there's a group of like people that I'm sort of trying out, you know, people who I either, maybe I taught them or I saw them in something or whatever it might be, people who I'm interested in, I'm curious about, you know, their, their career is on the rise or, any of those things. And then the third category is people I've never met. And in every session I do, I have a commitment that there are people I've never met in every session I do. That's a commitment because, you know, I'm assuming Dustin Hoffman started from nowhere at some point, you know, I'm assuming Tom Cruise did the same thing. I mean, you know, all these, um, everybody has to start somewhere. So, I, I would love to be the one who gave you your first job, who gave you your first opportunity. And, and, uh, and it's exciting to me, you know, especially, you know, when I can bring somebody who I believe in to uh, my clients and they go, yeah, and that's, there's nothing like that. But to realize that you were a part of helping somebody's career, you know, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary opportunity. Yeah, because uh, you just reminded me of something. I was watching an interview with Eric Bana, the Australian actor, and I actually did a podcast with the casting director who first signed him for the Chopper Reed movie. And the interviewee on the TV was asking him, um, you must be so happy of, I can't remember who the director was, give you your first break and he said no he didn't the casting director greg apps gave me my first break he's the first guy who believed in me and he put me forward to the ca to the director and i thought that's so interesting that he thought of that because it is it does start with the casting director and he said he owes it to him 
it is frustrating. I will tell you many times where, you know, director talks about, yeah, well, I cast this movie. It's like, uh, no, <laughs> you didn't cast the movie. Uh, um, and uh, there's a, you know, great push for uh, cast directors to get an Oscar, which we don't, which is ridiculous and um, various other things. So it's like, uh, a lot of the show is greatly influenced by what the cast director does. Uh, you know, he or she can really change how the project comes out. Um, I'm, I'm starting to produce now, and 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 I'm loving that because I'm able to kind of influence the production side now with what I'm doing as a cast director too. So it's kind of both sides working together, and it's it's a uh, it's challenging and and fun and um, and. And it's something that I've always thought people didn't pay enough attention to. I, and uh, a real quick story, I, I did this play many years ago um, and uh, the review in Variety was brilliant casting in blah, 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 blah. And the, the review goes on and on and on about, you know, brilliant casting, brilliant casting. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I get to the end and uh, he lists the the uh, uh, reviewer lists the director, the producer, the lighting person, the costume person, the stage manager, and like, and <laughs> I'm like, your whole review was about casting. You didn't mention me. I'm like, really? I called the guy up. It was a variety. So I called the guy up, and he goes, "Oh, it didn't even occur to me to mention you." I'm like, <laughs> and I went, and there it is in a nutshell. You know, it doesn't occur to you because we're sort of the bastard child of the industry. <laughs> so uh, we're trying to change that. So, and yeah, it's, so, it's so nice when an actor acknowledges uh, that, that the cast newer helped. So, Yeah, because it was the first time I ever heard someone say that. And you do, you would really need to love your job as casting because you don't really get the credit. You do. I mean, and sometimes it's nuts what we do. It's really nuts. Uh, sometimes you're under the gun, crazy... Uh, limited amount of time to come up with you know this thing that the director has in his or her mind and it's like, maybe that doesn't exist <laughs> um do you have a lot of do you have a lot of actors trying to put themselves in the way or send you postcards and try to uh i don't know what's like in australia whether postcards are a big thing there uh, postcards sort of disappeared here they people didn't do this much anymore but i'm i'm telling a lot of american actors that uh you know because everything's moved online here uh, I'm thinking that regular mail works right now because we get so little. We used to get a ton of regular mail, like ridiculous amounts of mail. And you couldn't open them all. It was just too much. And now it's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, right. so, uh, you know, a few postcards, a few postcards are not a bad thing, you know, right. and, um, and they sit on your desk and you go, oh, yeah. Uh, so when I'm watching that, I should take a look, so, you know. Um, and I think that if nothing else, what they do is they kind of keep your face. It's hard to take a postcard and throw it out without glancing on it, without, without glancing at it. Uh, so uh, on some level, we're connecting, and um, and it also shows that you're serious about your craft, that you're doing things, you know. And but don't just send a postcard just to send a postcard. Send a postcard as to you know why are you sending this postcard? I'm I'm appearing in a play. I'm appearing on a TV show. Or my commercial is running. I just signed with so-and-so agency. I mean, there's a number of reasons, you know, why to send a postcard. And I don't think it's a bad idea. Some, okay. some casting directors hate them. Yeah. Okay. So what? You can throw them out. Okay. But even if it's some assistant, you know, who kind of notices, and then maybe when you're submitted later, the assistant remembers that the postcard came through and maybe something clicks. So I think it's worth it. And some casting directors hate when, <coughs> excuse me, hate when you um, send some un clips unannounced or demo tapes. Some casting directors love it. Some casting directors say, I love it. As long as it's 10, 20 seconds, not five minutes. I have in five minutes. What's your preference? <laughs> I can click on your demo on any of the uh, breakdown uh, sites. So uh, I, I, I don't think it's worth it to send it. That's my opinion. Um, you could send me something that has a link, um, you know, on a postcard. That becomes a possibility. The other okay. thing too, the, the problem with that stuff is that, okay, so you send it out of the blue. I have nothing you're right for at the moment, let's say. And I loved it, but 
you know, six months go by and it's just kind of, you know, out of your head now. And you assume that because I saw it six months ago that I remember you. I mean, we have amazing memories. We're like elephants and we have this bizarre file cabinets in all of our heads, <laughs> which we can think about afterwards. But uh, I think it's better to wait to see something for something that you write, you are right for and then pursue. I think that makes more sense to me. How do you see it after the pandemic? Have you started using self-tapes, Michael, or are you still in the room? I've been in the room now. I mean, we shut down in March and uh, there's literally been nothing. Uh, theater is, at least in America, is just very quiet, except for what people are doing, like I said, in the online Zoom situations, which is sort of a different way to do theater. But in terms of live performances, there's nothing. Uh, in LA, even the big theater, the Amundsen is uh, not opening until April. Uh, so the first thing that I've got uh, planned at the moment is uh, early uh, next year. There are some readings uh, that are being done there and those I do take submissions on uh, when uh, if it's gonna be an online situation. But um, uh, I think self tapes are going to be the way to go. I, I think theater was the last holdout for self-tapes, but I think I, I think what this medium has taught us is that self-tapes can work. And, right. um, and it does save a step. It, it does mean that I, uh, as the casting director, have to look at all of the self-tapes and determine who goes to the step where they are live in front of the team when we can do that. Um, so we'll see. Um, uh, the thing that was always nice about theater was that sense of that immediacy. Again, when you're in the audition, you know, can somebody deliver right now, as opposed to a self tape that you corrected? Uh, which, by the way, correct your damn self tapes. Oh, so frustrating when somebody sends me a self tape with like boo boos on it. It's like what? You know, if you walk out of an audition um, for a theater piece and you're like, ah, I really screwed that up. It's like, okay, well, la la la, move on, right? But if you screwed it up in a self tape and you didn't redo it, it's like, what? <laughs> it's really, what are you thinking? How can you send that in? So make sure your self tape is, is, is a good one. So that's the huge advantage that you have of, of self taping. So yeah, I, I think self tapes are, are here to stay at least I, for the immediate future. And um, I think you need to get good at it. I think you need to understand how a self tape works um, and what, how to dress for a self tape, uh, how to put yourself, what's appropriate for backgrounds and things like that. Um, uh, nothing should pull focus from here, you know? So um, this is what it should all be about, this and the work. So I think that's something that people need to spend more time on. And self tapes, I, I like them because I get to, as you said, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it till I'm happy. But um, I did hear a good, uh, from a casting perspective point of view, I did hear a good, um, uh, a negative to self tapes is if you're the, if if you're the kind of casting director that likes to say yeah that that wasn't too bad, but can you just do this adjust? And I like to think as myself as I can take adjustments and I go from A to Z in the adjustment to try and show the range. Um, and you can't do that with a self tape. Are you the kind of casting director that likes to give a little of adjustments to an actor? Because I'm a director too, yes. So uh -huh. especially that, it's like incredibly frustrating to me. Uh, but, you know, as we figure this out, um, one of the possibilities would be is if I call your agent and say you have a callback, I can also give you notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can say, you know, don't wear the black shirt, you know, uh, or understand, um, you know, this needs to be a little broader or a little subtler, you know, whatever it might be, or you're missing this beat, all those things that could happen now. So it can still happen. It would just happen differently. What I'm missing is if I, if I give you a direction, can you follow it? There are times I often tell my students, like, we're going to give you a direction that we have no intention of using just to mm -hmm. see are you flexible? Can you listen? Can you take direction? Are you willing to play? You know, a lot of times I'm doing uh, world premieres. So who knows if the script is going to say the same? The, the, the words you're saying right now might not be the words that you say ultimately. Well, if you can only make it work saying these words with this interpretation, then we're in trouble. 
I need somebody who's you know flexible. I need somebody who is uh, uh, directable. I need somebody who is um, creative, fun, you know, good in the room, not an asshole. <laughs> uh, seriously, that's part of it too. You know, when you give a, a redirect to an actor, how does the actor react when you give them that direction? You know what a lot of actors do? Oh, well, what I meant was what I was trying to do was, and um, it's like, I, I didn't say you were terrible. I never said you were terrible. I just want to try something else. You know, but that whole thing about defensive, 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 it's like, whoa, that's going to be tough when you're being directed to, in rehearsal. You know, we're trying things. Great. I, as opposed to it being a negative when you're being directed, make it a positive. Somebody is interested in playing with me. So clearly they think there's some potential here as opposed to, uh, you know, defending what you're doing. Just listen. Try to do that. I'm, I have to tell you, as an actor, I was terrible at that. I was terrible at it. I'd be like thinking, I wish that director would shut up so I can figure out what I'm going to do with the next take. <laughs> As opposed to just quiet, breathe, yeah. listen. Just listen. Take it in. Because we're here to help you. We're here to try to make this work. You know, especially if, you know, if it's a director that I've worked with many times, which I, again, am lucky to repeat with a lot of the same directors, and I know her or his taste, and I know where they want to go, and I can really guide you. I can help. Or, you know, maybe there's been a particularly difficult section of the script, and now I get it. I know where they want to go with this. I'm going to give you that hint, you know? So listen. Yeah, I, um, Jim Sheeran said when he was working with Daniel Day-Lewis that Daniel Day-Lewis would come so prepared that his job as a director was to take that preparation and just scramble it, scramble it up on him because get him so like confused with the preparation that it was so raw in the moment. I, I think that what I would, my take on that would be, be as prepared as possible, absolutely, but be just as ready to let it go. Yeah. Because you may walk in yeah. and realize the director sees this completely differently than you do. Okay. So you can either be willing to play and jump right in and see if, if you can make that work. Or if you go, okay, I think the director's nuts. You don't have to take the job, you know? Uh, but I think uh, be willing to do that. It, it, it speaks volumes to what you're going to be like on a set. You know, if we're, if we're casting you, it's not like we're going to be around you for, you know, an hour. We're with you for, depending on the project, certainly days, you know, sometimes weeks, months, if you're going to play, if it runs for, you know, tours for two years. I mean, all these things. Uh, and uh, the initial impression is very important. It says a lot about you and, uh, and, and the future of working with you. I have, to, I have to tell you that too. There are times too, you know, when, I think an actor focuses a great deal on the audition and a lot less on the career. And I'm hoping that if I'm auditioning you, this isn't gonna be the only time we're gonna meet. So you may not be right for what we're doing right now, but if I fall in love with you, boom, you're in. You're gonna be coming in again and again and again. So. So that's really what it's about for me is that if you're always doing good work, you're always listening, you're always prepared, you're always making specific choices, then the reality is the percentages are you know, hugely against you. You may have done a kick-ass job and still not get the job, but you've impressed the casting director, the director, the producer, the writer, whoever, all the people that might be in the room. And now we're all, you're somewhere in that weird file cabinet now. And there's gonna be, who was that guy that we saw? Ba 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 ba. And it's like, you know, the, like I always picture this little man running through all the files and go, ah, got him, boom. And then you're in, you know? And, and, that's, and that's how it happens. So I think, I think, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the auditions because auditions suck. Nobody likes auditions. It is fucking terrible. Like, hate them. But I, I know a lot of people that, because auditions, there's way more auditions in Los Angeles, but auditions here are f far few, right? So people will just audition 
to get good at audition but not want the role and how does that sit with a casting director to go this guy just comes in and we offer to him and he doesn't want it because he just because it could be free roles here people are doing stuff for free but then they just want to do the audition to get good at auditions because auditions do suck and we need to practice for that big audition uh, how does that sit with casting directors because I could, I could imagine that could piss you guys off a lot I can say is I can speak personally and it sits really badly with me um, if if you went to the first audition and you came away, like I said, not liking what the director had to say to you, uh, not liking the vibe in the room, uh, felt that you were disrespected, I mean, or just went, um, you know, even as you read it, went, this just doesn't sing with me, it doesn't feel right, whatever it is, and you get a callback, turn the callback down. There's no problem with that. And by the way, what I wouldn't do is pass. This is a suggestion that I have for you. When you're, you know, a major star you can pass but when you're a struggling actor don't pass say oh i booked a conflict or it's a little mm -hmm. white lie but I, i'm no longer available thank you so much you know we understand you're auditioning for other things that's cool but if you went to the callback and then you got it and then turn it down so it was masturbation is basically what it was right <laughs> that's what it was you wanted to see if you could do it. And, and, and that's what you did. And, and you left us going, what were you hoping to get? You know? So now what you've done is, again, thinking career, now you've pissed off career, a casting director, producer, writer, or director, whoever else is in the room. Oh, that guy who went all the way through callbacks and then turned it down. Not cool. Now, what does sometimes happen is, and I'm very cool with this, you know, I will uh, send out a callback. The agent will say, I just want you to know he's also called back for such and such. Great. Cool. No problem. So I tell my clients, just so you know, he's up for two things. You might get both. And then you take one or the other. Totally fine. Totally fine. But um, I think you weren't being honest with yourself if you went to that callback, uh, knowing that you were going to turn it down. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. So uh, going to the first call where you're not so sure, that's okay. Second call, mm-mm. Make sure that you really want to do this. And that goes to a lot of things too. It's, it's not just about the, the project. It's like being honest with yourself about things like nudity and, uh, 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 you know, do you want to be seen in this role? I mean, actors are sometimes not honest with themselves um, uh, selves about, you know, what they are willing to do. You know, they told you that you're going to need to cut your hair for this part. You know, and you're a woman with hair down to here. You're going to have to cut it into like this short cut. And you don't really want to do that. Well, why'd you go to the call that? You know, uh, they said they weren't willing to wig you. They, they're they going to cut your hair. So just know that you, your hair is going to get cut. Well, why'd you go to the call that? Um, those things kind of just are really annoying because you're just not thinking as a professional. And does that happen a lot where people will change their appearance after they've been given the second callback? Not as often as it used to be. Um, but it's still, sometimes it's out there. You know, I had an actor once who uh, had to, he's, he's going to be shirtless in the role for quite a bit. And uh, at, at the callback, he took his shirt off and his body was perfectly fine. But it was like, we were looking for sort of a, oh my God, feel a little bit to this guy. And he, and he said, I can get there. And he had a picture of what he looked like with it when he had done it before. So we trusted him and he did. I mean, when he took his shirt off, it was like, wow, <laughs> by the time we got to the show. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. Uh, so, but, you know, he knew that he could do that. Um, it's just other people just not being honest with themselves about it. The nudity is an issue too. It's like, why, you know, if you're not comfortably being naked, why would you audition for a role in which you're going to have to be naked? It's just not being honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. so. Going back to casting and back to the actor, do you get a bit of a, do you look at the commercial side of it to say that this play, we need to get bums into seats? So we're gonna look. We're gonna look at someone with a bit of street credit, a bit of a social media following. Is that a push that you would get as well, Michael? I'm getting it from my clients about the social media thing too. That is starting to creep up. And I thought, you know, theater would be safe from that, but it's theater is no longer even safe from that too. Um, although I just did a, a, I'm not gonna say who it is. It's not fair, but a social media star wrote a musical about <laughs> the social media stardom <laughs> and kind of really skewered it and uh it's pretty fun so i, I think i think it's going to have a life this thing so you'll get to see it at some point but um yeah i think it's part of the reality i think if you can build your social media presence yeah why not uh 
and it just depends on the level of the project. Uh, you know, we got to put butts in seats. Uh, we have to pay for it. It's 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 really that simple, um, and it's not always so easy to do. You know, chasing the celebrity thing is uh, it's a royal pain in the ass. It's just it's it's the thing that I probably like the least about my job is chasing the celebrity because a lot of times they don't even know the offer's going out there you know and the agent filters it so much and you know and i run into i happen to run into the celebrity or something sometimes i know some of them and then they're like oh i don't know anything about that i'm like great uh and then you don't know whether they're telling the truth <laughs> either so um but you know you need them uh, and uh, they do sell tickets and so um the theater is a good example. It used to be that you went, you became a name on Broadway and then went and had a film and television career, right? Now you have a film and television career and go star in a show on Broadway. <laughs> so. Yeah, that used to, that used to be the way, didn't it? Uh, and, and while we're, while we're on social media, uh, I got a couple of questions. One was that, do you, will you check out a social media? So will you look for, anybody that is quite outspoken politically or racially that may offend that may come that may be a reason why they not get the job if they're very too left very too right and they're very out there publicly that it could um, I'll, I'll give you an example i've got a friend here i won't say who it is but he was quite outspoken about when we were um voting for gay marriage in sydney and he was in a production and he was made take it down because it could damage the production of the movie that was coming out wow you know um i can't tell you that it doesn't influence decisions uh it would be i think we'd be naive to say that it doesn't affect it on some level um i don't troll social media looking for that stuff you know I, i'm not a big social media person I'm, to be tr truthful about it uh i'm getting a little bit more uh, my associate is much better about social media so he usually handles that part um but it's not just social media it's any kind of political uh thing that you're involved with yeah i mean there are some you know actors who are republicans who have been bitching on you know online about they're not getting cast because they're you know uh the film and television world tends to be more Democrats and yeah, I guess it's a factor. Not, not as much in theater, but uh, I think in theater we're especially liberal and more open and, uh, and I think that we kind of have always approached a lot of taboo subjects openly. So um, I think if you are super conservative, I don't know how you would feel comfortable uh, in that environment mm. for the most part. So, yeah, I mean, uh, especially something like if, you, if, you, if you're not supporting gay marriage, uh, good luck in the theater. Because <laughs> uh, an awful lot of us are gay. <laughs> That's just um, the way it is. So. The Married to a man. <laughs> the... Um... So we're coming up to an hour, but I do want to get into your coaching um, and you helping actors and your intensive work, your workshops. Uh, I guess just uh, how do your workshops run and, and how do people work with you? Uh, it is, well, when we could work in the room, but do, we, do you work by Zoom now with, with students? We're in discussion right now to talk about working by Zoom. I, I certainly have done some coaching by Zoom and, uh, and I, I did... Uh, I, I directed uh, two showcases uh, uh, for uh, graduating seniors from colleges here um, when everything moved, you know, online. Uh, all the colleges, I don't know if you do it in Australia too, but all the colleges at the end of their senior year do a showcase in which agents and managers come and see their work live. Uh, and so all of that went away. So we had to figure out a way how to move that online. And we did, it, it worked pretty well, um, I have to say. Uh, so there's that. Um, I do some coaching. Uh, I also uh, teach um, a musical theater workshop, uh, professional uh, musical theater workshops in a uh, workshop in Los Angeles that has been put on hold uh, because of uh, the virus. But 
uh, we're discussing now figuring out can we do that in an online way? And I think we can. So uh, right now, I think it's a big period of adjustment for everybody. Um, I do think classes can exist. I, one of the things that concerns me, of course, is that uh, you know people are broke. Uh, and so I don't feel especially comfortable charging you know what i would normally charge and all that kind of thing so i'm trying to figure out a way to make it work for everybody involved uh, so that it, it's something that um uh, keeps people's uh, chops up and and i love it i absolutely love it and so we're figuring that out we are in a period of transition being really straight with you um i know there are a lot of classes going on online um and uh I've just been a little resistant to try to figure that out because mostly what I teach is, is mostly what I teach is musical theater, but there's other things too. So, um, and just real quick about musical theater for those of you who are auditioning for musical theater right now, the trend tends to be for a self tape. If you're the singing part, sing into camera, but the reading part of the audition, take it slightly off camera and the way you would, if you were reading with a reader or a partner, you wouldn't look down the nose of the, of the, of the lens. So, you know, just, um, but sing there and read slightly off. And then again, ask me in six months, it might be different. <laughs> <laughs> so how are your, your workshops normally structured, Michael? Are they just for the audition purpose and how to? Um, uh, the one that I do regularly here is a six week workshop where I basically cover soup to nuts, everything about auditioning for the musical theater. And then I bring in um, agents and managers at the end. So for the last class, so you finish up, you can get hopefully get some representation when you're done too. And so it's kind of cool and it's great because I'm meeting again, this whole new wave of talent that I haven't met that I can bring in for auditions. And so, uh, but uh, don't go to a casting director's workshop just to be seen. You know, those workshops are almost all gone. Uh, it's the wrong reason. Go to learn, go to, you know, learn from any teacher. I think it's super important to study with a lot of people. I think to get different opinions, uh, we're not going to agree with each other. Well, welcome to what the world is going to be like. You know, uh, you're going to get a lot of different opinions. And I think what you need to do is, as a performer, is sift through and figure out what you can use and what works for you. Um, and some things, you know, uh, some things I'll say to an actor, like, you know, three years later, they'll go, you know, I didn't buy that when you taught that to me in class, and now I understand it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. As soon as it takes a while for, oh. I still do that with the Meisner because I studied Meisner for years and I still today go, oh, that's what he means. Yeah. I was lucky enough to catch Stella Adler at the very end of her life. I got one of the last classes she taught. And so, I mean, she was amazing. Uh, you have to run us through that. Tell us a little bit about that class. Uh, it's, like I always say about Stella, everything you've heard, all the good, all the bad, it's all true. No, <laughs> I mean, she was brilliant. Absolutely. Some of the things she said were just brilliant. And some of the stuff that she said was like, oh, that's so 40 years ago. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the point that I'm trying to make is that I took away, I could sift through the, you know, stuff that was you know, not appropriate anymore and just hear the brilliant things. And, and, and they really stuck with me. So, uh, yeah, I get different opinions. It's it's important. Um, yeah. yeah, she was a, a grand dame. She was fantastic. I love Stella Adler. The throne, you know, about the throne and the light on her, and everything. it was great. <laughs> I just I just love her unfiltered, no bullshit approach. You know. Oh my God, the things I can't repeat some of the things that she said in class. That was, <laughs> wow, it was one girl that she went after was like. Whoa! <laughs> so, yeah, she was harder on women, I think, than she was on men. So. Michael, this has been fantastic. Has there is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to put out there, and and um, for also for people, how can people reach you or want to work with you? What's the yeah, I mean, basically, uh, just so you guys know, uh, virtually every breakdown, uh, every job that I do is on breakdown. I don't hide my jobs. Uh, so I'm out there and, uh, if it's a, a stage, uh, job, then I'm in all the various publications. Uh, if, if it's an equity job, I'm also on the equity website. So it's pretty easy to find me when I'm, when I'm doing something. Um, 
in terms of uh, reaching me, I have a, a post office box. You can send me stuff there. I, you want that right now? I'll give it to you. It's it's Michael Donovan Casting. It's PO Box three forty nine, Hollywood, California nine zero zero seven eight. And you can always send me anything, um, and I'm happy to look at. It. And um, um, yeah, I mean, I think what I would say to you is you are lucky enough to be doing something you love to do and that is a gift that you gave to yourself there's no way to know if it'll work and you know no way to know if you're going to be a star all that stuff is blah 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 whatever but keep in mind that you're doing something that you love and as so many people never gave themselves that gift so. well that's a nice way to finish it Thank you so much, Michael. And we're going to put all your, your man. It's so nice to work with you. I wish you much success too. So get the hell out of Sydney. Come. Uh, I was supposed to be, I'm supposed to be there, but COVID had different plans for me. For all of us, for all of us. And that's the other thing too. Let's have faith. Let's have faith. Let's have faith. This is, we're going to get past this. We're going to be okay. And you know, uh, those of us who are in the theater, I mean, we, we beat all kinds of odds all the time. Oh, right. We beat the <laughs> sucker too. So it's going to be okay. So. Great. Michael, you're a champion. champion. Thank you very much.